In the last episode of this video series, I spent the vast majority of my time praising Season 2, and fortunately my praise of it continues with Episode 8, Titan Rising. However, I still think that there are certain ways that the episode could have improved, although the main source of those improvements would come from slight alterations to previous episodes. Basically, Episode 8 focuses on Terra's and Raven's relationship, and on how Raven goes from not trusting Terra upon her return to trusting her. While it is reasonable for Raven to distrust Terra, I think that her position could have been strengthened if, at some point in one of the previous episodes, there had been an indication that she was frustrated with Terra or worried about what they would do if she returned. Having little moments like that would have helped the individual episodic plots of the story tie in with the season's overarching plot, and would create a more natural sense of pacing. This isn't to say that any of the previous episodes needed to spend any large amount of time focusing on this. In fact, I think that would likely be a bad idea, since that would take away from the focus of those episodes. I just feel that these side stories could be integrated into the plot in subtle ways that would lead to a greater sense of narrative cohesion. The reason that the writers didn't do this, however, is likely because of how the show was presented to its audience. If a child was watching individual episodes here and there when they could catch them on TV, having references to a larger plot could be off-putting or confusing. But if that was the reason why these side stories and main plots are so thoroughly separated, and I'm really assuming here, I don't think it quite makes sense. After all, viewers would be likely to catch separate episodes of the main plot anyway, which would be just as potentially confusing, if not more so. Still, it's possible that my theory for why these episodes are structured this way is completely incorrect and that there was some other reason for this. But regardless of the reasons, I would have preferred if some reference was made to Terra in those episodes or even just in one of those episodes. The reasons aren't really what matter to me here, the end product is. But beyond that, this is a strong episode. It was a good choice to have someone in the Titans distrust Terra, since that makes her betrayal even more upsetting later on, and it also forces Terra into a pretty interesting situation. See, she only left because she mistakenly thought Beast Boy had betrayed her trust and because of her unruly powers. And yet now, when her powers are under her control and when the Titans trust her, when her main problems have seemingly been fixed, she uses her control to manipulate the Titans. But this has gone beyond an issue that pertains to her powers and spread outward from there. This is a personality issue. Even now, even when she has gained the ability to carve her own path and consciously do the right thing, even when the thing that has caused her self-loathing is no longer really there, she continues to act in a way that is in line with her previous self. Because the only reason she'd really have to do something like this would be that she believes that the Titans truly betrayed her when, really, the fact that they accept her now makes it abundantly clear that they never did. In fact, it seems as though she only went through with this plan because she believed that it would never work, because she believed that the Teen Titans would never trust her. As such, at the end of the episode when she says, I don't believe it, they actually trust me. These are simultaneously the words that confirm that she has gone even further down her path of self-destruction, and the words that confirm that she can, in fact, escape from this cycle. That option has been provided to her. This is what makes Terra compelling to me. When she's finally received what she's wanted, it doesn't matter anymore because in the end, she needs to trust herself. Nobody else can do the right thing for her, they can only put her in scenarios that facilitate her doing the right thing. No matter how her outer world looks, her self-loathing will lead to her hurting others and destroying her relationships. She can lift her new home out of the rubble, but if she lifts it out for the wrong reasons, she will never be able to rest easy there. Unfortunately, that lack of narrative cohesion I mentioned that is caused by the episodic episodes having so little to do with the overarching plot becomes more problematic in the following episode and episode 11, both of which take place after Terra-centric episodes but ignore her existence almost entirely, if not entirely. This is especially strange in episode 9, where there's no real reason to ignore her. Sure, she shows up briefly, but beyond that she's just… gone. And why wouldn't she be here playing cards with the other titans? Having her there would be a solid way to build up their relationship more before bringing it crashing down. Sure, we've seen her fight to become a titan, but we also need to see her being a titan, and the more settings we see that in, the better. So sure, we need to see her fighting bad guys with them, but we also need to see her just relaxing with them and having fun. I really can't think of any negative to including her here, or at least mentioning why she isn't involved, I'm not sure why this decision was made. Other than that, however, this is one of those episodes I think I would have enjoyed a lot when I was younger, but that I don't find that much interest in now. The main theme, as explored in this tournament, is that winning isn't everything, which to be fair is a good lesson for children to learn, but at this point that feels like a very simple lesson that I've already learned. I do like how the tournament itself is constructed though, with some familiar faces returning and the natural introduction of some new people. This is a really good way to introduce them, and having previously established boys appear helps bring the story together, and makes this episode feel a little bit less separate from the rest of the series, in a way that actually adds to the episode itself. 
Another good aspect of this episode is that the direction in the fight scenes is overall very well done and some of the fights are quite creative. Honestly though, it's hard to dive too deep into this episode since it's just a simple but fast tournament that manages to effectively convey its simple message. It does end in a way I'm not fond of though, and episode 11 ends similarly. They both leave us with an open end, where the plot isn't resolved and we just have to assume that it gets resolved before the main plot of the season picks up in the next episode. Part of what frustrates me about this is that oftentimes, I'm actually more interested in seeing how these characters will get themselves out of the situation they find themselves in in the final moments of the episode than I was in the episode itself. This is particularly pertinent at the end of this episode because, well, it actually might have been a better idea to have this tournament be the Tournament of Heroines. That way we could have seen more of Terra, and if she were to be the last one standing in the tournament, we would also get even more of a sense of how strong she is. Regardless of the specifics though, seeing more of her at this point would have been a good thing, and I don't think seeing this tournament with the female characters instead of the male characters would be any less interesting. Fortunately, I consider episode 10 a large improvement over episode 9, and it adds quite a lot to Terra's character and fleshes out her struggle. In particular, I enjoy these little moments where the show slows down and we see Terra struggling with her decision to portray the Titans. Where the show lingers just a bit too long on Terra, and without anything explicitly being said, communicates to the viewer that she isn't entirely sure if she wants to do what she's doing now. And it makes sense that she's questioning herself here, as the episode puts a lot of emphasis on Beast Boy's trust in her and on her trust in Beast Boy. All of their scenes have a fantastic tension to them, with the show periodically cutting back to Titan's Tower being attacked. This reminds us that, although this is the closest we've ever seen Terra and Beast Boy, every moment it's getting harder for her to turn back. No matter what happens on this night, she can't take back what she's already done, what's happening right at that moment. Despite the fact that it's natural for the audience to hope that she'll change her mind here and choose to be good. And she's also reminded that she already had what she wanted most of all, a home full of people who accept her and care for her. But even as the strongest reminders of that are slapping her right in the face, the reminder that it may be too late is slapping the audience right in the face. Part of what's great about this is how much it adds to Beast Boy's character too. His fight with Slade on the Ferris wheel, in fact the whole fight between Slade, Terra, and him in the amusement park, is easily the most emotional fight up till now in the series. The fact that Beast Boy fights so hard for her is just crushing and it adds so much to his character. Sure, he may be an overall happy-go-lucky guy, but here we see that his care for others can quickly turn into intense rage and sadness. This episode also has some neat imagery, mainly in the House of Mirrors, where Beast Boy is surrounded by Slade just as the truth becomes inescapable and there's no way to ignore Terra's strange actions and potential betrayal. Similarly, Terra is forced to confront her fractured self, to look in the mirror and see what she's become, how all of her fractured identities have come together to allow this moment to be possible, where she loses everything she ever wanted. I could go on, but I think if you're at all invested in Terra's struggle, this episode is a great one. And very well executed. Unfortunately, I really don't like season 2's 11th episode. In it, Robin makes a mistake and breaks his arm and is forced to let his friends take care of things while he heals. However, things get strange when a different version of himself from a different dimension appears and starts accidentally causing trouble. While my usual problem with these sorts of episodes breaking up the flow of the story still stands, my main problem is actually with how it handles Robin's character and his progression. Up until now, Robin's major flaw has been his constant reliance on himself and his inability to just let his friends get the job done. Yet here, when Robin finally lets his friends get things done for him, he's told that he needs to keep trying no matter what. And the episode puts a lot of emphasis on how it's a good thing for him to keep trying. Now, I think the idea here is that he's gone too far in the other direction, that he's gone from being unable to trust his friends at times to giving up on himself. So, in some ways, this is making sense so far. Meanwhile, this other version of Robin gets involved, causing trouble because now he won't stop and let other people get the job done. So he's a very extreme version of the problem Robin had before, but with a little bit of a difference in that he's just trying to help and he's not shutting anyone else out. The strange part of this is, now that Robin's finally chosen to trust his friends, they can't do this without him. In fact, it's so bad that they completely fail and he has to essentially fix it all on his own. This seems to strengthen his original position and uncertainty with trusting his friends. This episode makes it seem like the most important thing is that Robin always tries, no matter how broken or unprepared for battle he is, because he's the only one who can save the day in the end. I think it's pretty clear how this goes against the previously established themes and lessons that surround Robin. But oddly enough, the show seems to agree with me on some level, considering how Robin gets transported to this empty white space and now needs to escape at the end of the episode. And the reason for this is because he just told this doppelganger of his to give it a shot when the doppelganger was trying to fix his arm. So the lesson then is that people shouldn't always just try no matter how unprepared they are. I know I'm digging into this comedic episode pretty deep and that overall it's just meant to be a funny and fun episode to break up a more serious part of a story. But I think that episodes like this that are supposed to be fun can still remain thematically consistent with the rest of the series and build on those established ideas. 
There's no reason that development and fun need to be separated here. But this episode isn't all bad. The chase scenes are interesting enough, and I like this coloring book aesthetic, for example, but ultimately I don't think that these are the most important parts of the episode, so overall my feelings are still pretty negative about this one, and I think that the show would be better without this episode. This is even more so the case because the next episode isn't going to show more of the aftermath of Terra leaving the group. What I mean is that we never see the Titans thinking about Terra when she's not there, and this could be a good chance to spend more time doing that. Instead, we got this. With how this episode plays out, it seems like the Titans only really think of Terra when she's there, even though I'm sure that isn't meant to be the case. I'm sure that they're supposed to be upset that she's left them and that they think about that. I'd be shocked if they didn't. Next up is the first part of Aftershock, which, while it's by no means a bad episode, is pretty messy and the weakest part of Terra's journey so far. What I mean is that this episode just doesn't make that much sense. After all, how do the Titans survive each of their encounters with Terra? While some of their fights ended in ways that could have resulted in the Titans living, other fights with her ended pretty conclusively with their deaths, and yet they just somehow got out of it. It's a real shame that this is never explained in any way, because when they return at the end of the episode, it's very perplexing how they even got there. However, that isn't to say that there's nothing good about this episode. Seeing the Titans struggle to fight Terra brings home just how close they were. Having these previous bad guys return to fight them connects this season with the first season, and is a way better decision than bringing in new baddies. Terra's negative rhetoric continues to expose her fundamental flaws and shows how her self-image has caused her to view everyone around her in an unfair and harmful light. Still, the logic problem stuck out to me in a way that was impossible to ignore and that made this episode far more rocky than any of the other Terra-centric episodes. It's here that there's a very real sense that the writers had to rush through the section of the story for some reason or another. Fortunately, the second part of Aftershock is much stronger. The way it's structured is extremely powerful. I especially like the beginning section where, as Terra goes through this decimated city, she thinks about her time with the Titans, about the good times she's had and that she can never go back to. She's surrounded by a shell of the life she could have had and by constant reminders of what it was. And now the colors have been drained from this world and even her friends are mere shadows of what they could have been and what they were. The music in this episode is also particularly great. Every piece flows into the next naturally and it makes the pacing of this episode feel near perfect. The increased connectivity between scenes it brings makes the whole episode feel like one extended scene, even though it's obviously not that. There's nothing fractured here. It's very smooth storytelling. Then there's one of my favorite parts of Terra's struggle, where escaping Slade becomes nearly impossible, where she's taken things so far that there's no way that she can just turn back based on her own power. Slade has literally taken over control of her body. As he says, he's become a part of her and she no longer has control in the matter. While this works on a literal level within the story very well, it also works on a metaphorical level. The longer someone stays with an abuser, the harder it is to escape from them. The more they allow some horrible person's ideology to affect them, the more likely that they can take on that ideology in a way that is a part of their self, in a way that cannot simply be escaped through sheer willpower or thinking it through. She gave up her free will to control her powers, and now she's even lost control of that. And as Beast Boy is sure to remind her, she chose all of this. She can try to blame someone else, try to say that they're making her do this, but she ultimately let it happen. The show does a really good job of placing some blame on Terra here, while still managing to paint her decidedly as Slade's victim. It's a pretty nuanced take on how someone who's abused can become an abuser, on how self-hatred can become a hatred of others. And not once did I feel that Terra as a character was being vilified or blamed in a way that was unfair to her. There's also this moment where Terra manages to gain some form of redemption, when she sacrifices herself in order to fix the mess she helped create, and stops everything from getting destroyed. This redemption is by no means a perfect one, and it's not meant to be. What she does here doesn't stop what she did before from being wrong, but it does show a complexity of character and a change that I appreciate. Ultimately, we're each going to make our own judgement call on how much we think Terra redeemed herself or on how good of a person she was, but I think that's part of what makes this arc great. Tara isn't just a black and white character, and even if she does the right thing at the end, she's ultimately just fixing her own mistakes. She's complex and hard to pin down. As I said last time, I know that some people find Tara annoying, that they find her inability to make a choice and stick with it obnoxious and perplexing, but I really enjoyed her arc. I feel that the complexity of character and the weight of her journey brought far more positives than negatives to the series, and I hope that the show will continue down this path of becoming more complex in its themes and characterization in its upcoming seasons. As always, thank you for watching this series and engaging with it. It's amazing to me how well this series is doing and how well my channel is doing now because of this and because of your support. I also want to specifically thank all my patrons over on patreon.com. 
the fact that I see that somebody sees so, so much value in this uh, helps me to keep going with it and helps me to keep making these. So thank you so much to all those people for what they do. Thank you to all of you for watching, and I hope that you have a fantastic day. Bye-bye.